dedicated to freeing the world from monarchical power, from aristocratic privilege, and constrained popular rights. For them, the nation was not an end in itself, but the mechanism by which political freedom and individual rights might be universally achieved. Lincoln provided the model of how to transcend one's nation to become a symbol of the common people's universal struggle. And so, in Spain, the progresistas of the revolutionary Saxonian of 1868-74 paid homage to Lincoln, the democratic hero. Garibaldi's Italian Democrats saw in the combined force of emancipation and assassination Lincoln's potency as a champion of Republican liberty. French liberals and Republicans brandished Lincoln as a weapon of popular democracy in their assault on Napoleon III and the conservative establishment of the Second Empire. He won admirers amongst German radicals and following the Meiji Restoration, Japanese modernizers. Cubans, above all the independence leader Jose Marti, expelled Lincoln as an uncorrupted natural man whose democratic wisdom derived from his authenticity as a man of the people. <clears throat> Several leading German social democrats and other anti-Nazis of the final republic found the, uh, their ideological anchor in Lincoln. He inspired influential figures amongst the Slavic minorities of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Thomas Masaryk, the self-made scholar, intellectual, and first president of Czechoslovakia, began by pressing for progressive reform and Czech autonomy within the empire. But after 1914, he invoked Lincoln, uh, Lincoln's democratic ideas, in the talk in the pursuit of full independence. Lincoln's sublime exaltation of the people, the Gettysburg Address, became the credo of separatist and consolidationist nationalists. Very important to uh, identify those two different strands of nationalism, separatist and consolidationist. Each of these groups invoking the democratic basis of the cause. The versatility and utility of that address, the Gettysburg Address, is no better exemplified than in its adoption by both Irish Unionists and Irish Republican Nationalists. I believe fundamentally in the right of the Irish people to govern themselves, Eamon de Valera declared in 1921. I believe fundamentally in government of the people, by the people, and if I may add the other part, for the people. But no less earnestly, covenanting Ulster Unionists, years later, swore an oath en masse that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the Ulster people, by the Ulster people, for the Ulster people, within the United Kingdom, shall not perish from the earth. So indicative of the ecumenical applications of Lincoln's thought are the many ways in which he was invoked to qualify or to, uh, to complicate a simple celebration of the nation state. His appropriation by exponents of pan-Americanism exemplifies an attempt to separate Lincoln from the nation and to deploy him on behalf of an alternative, supranational structure that would contain and control the ambitions of a powerful nation like the United States. The co-option of Lincoln by British liberals as part of a larger Anglo-Saxonism revealed how Lincoln could be embraced as a racialized, uh, in, a, in a racialized transnational way uh, that sat awkwardly with his own concept of the nation. Central to Lincoln's appeal abroad was his reputation as the archetypal self-made man. And the narrative of his rise from obscure and humble origins through self-education, through enterprise, and through hard work, and the simple virtues of the natural man, these were, uh, this was a very important narrative. The image of Lincoln, the rail splitter, is perhaps as ubiquitous beyond the United States as it is at home. The self-made man theme harmonized with the democratic aspiration of many of Lincoln's foreign admirers. It also, of course, personified the miraculous economic growth of the United States in the 19th century. And what gave Lincoln special power was the way he served as an example of how the interests of the individual self-improving laborer could be congruent with, indeed inseparable from, the larger development and modernization of a national economy. This view of Lincoln was most frequently articulated in places undergoing rapid economic development, in Sarmiento, Argentina, early 20th century Japan, and later the independent Ghana of 
Carmack and Bruno, where Lincoln served as, as hope or reassurance that the dislocating changes of economic modernization uh, would benefit both the individual and the larger polity. In the popular narratives of this era, emancipation and racial liberation are more often than not a lesser theme. Although Lincoln's emancipationist record meant he could be deployed as an anti-slavery champion, and in India he would become an inspiration to those engaged in the struggle to end caste slavery, more often than not this aspect of his achievement served as a symbolic element in the larger narrative of the hero of democratic freedom. So when Irish separatists paid tribute to Lincoln for freeing the slaves, it was to make a link with national liberation. German socialists, following the enthusiastic example of Karl Marx, who was a great admirer of Lincoln, they tended to celebrate Lincoln, the slave's liberator for his emancipation of the class, the class of slaves, and not uh, slaves as a race. In Cuba, as in Brazil, Lincoln certainly featured in debates over abolition, but his predominant image in those countries was that of the nation builder, not the emancipator. That too was the case in Argentina, where his influential biographer, Domingo Faustino Sargento, confronting the power of entrenched local interests to obstruct centralizing liberals, they praised Lincoln's tenacity in the face of southern disunionists and his harnessing of abolitionist energies in the cause of unity. Lincoln's emancipationist record took on special significance for what it said about his humanitarianism, his moral code, and his religion. Elements which led an early 20th century Japanese biographer to deem him the kindest man amongst the great men and the greatest man among the kind men. Well, that Lincoln never made, in fact, a declaration of Christian faith and that his celebration of reason made him the hero of the secularists was no barrier to his widespread representation as a man of faith. In Britain, in particular, Lincoln, the foe of slavery, as well as the abstainer from alcohol and tobacco, won a place in the hearts and minds of pious, reform-driven Protestant church -goers. The members of the predominating non-conformist traditions here in Wales, many of whom would have read and reread Uncle Tom's Cabin in their native tongue. It's worth noting that Uncle Tom's Cabin is the first novel translated into Welsh. And who championed teetotalism these Welsh nonconformists saluted Lincoln for his religious devotion. This was a reading strengthened by the circumstances of his death. Booth's bullet created a sacrificial figure, a martyr who died to bring an end to the suffering of others, a composite of Moses and the redemptive Christ, whose Good Friday passion he shared. Remember that Lincoln was shot on Good Friday. And so for Costella, he was a new Moses, removed in the very moment of his victory, like Christ, like Socrates, like all redeemers. Jose Marti found the spirit of Christ in him. French Freemasons regarded him as the sublimest martyr who came into the world, like Jesus of Bethlehem, to take away his sins. Garibaldi yoked them as the two transformational giants in history, Jesus and Lincoln. And Lincoln's martyrdom spoke directly to the Christianized Westerners of Meiji, Japan. Now, in many readings, Lincoln, the gentle humanitarian, accompanied the forceful, resolute defender of constitutionalism and the strong-willed, unyielding nationalist. He spoke to the often profoundly religious elements within the forces of aspirational nationalism. But to uphold justice and the democratic principle, a leader might have to overcome his natural inclination for peace have to learn the arts of war. Argentinians, Germans, Irish, Italians, Slavs, all of these and more, found in Lincoln a supreme model of robustness in defending the principle of national unity. Indomitable, manly, physically and morally, morally strong, Lincoln evinced a firmness of purpose that took him to the edge of constitutional legitimacy, but whose natural prudence would let him travel no further. Conscription, the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. The American Union's other war measures had not spilled over into despotism. Popular opinion had been respected. So Lincoln became the epitome of firm, prudent, and moderate war leadership. 
And no one expresses better than David Lloyd George. 